Mindful Dietitian podcast. I'm Fiona Sutherland, body inclusive non diet dietitian and yoga teacher from Melbourne, Australia, and director of The Mindful Dietitian. Please join me as I have important conversations with dietitians and health professionals from all over the world about getting brave and leaning into tough conversations as we cultivate a strong community of practitioners committed to body inclusive practice. We'll talk about mindfulness, we'll dig into diet culture, and we'll explore ways of bringing courageous and important topics into our professional spaces so we can more deeply understand our own experience and make our work more meaningful. Thank you for joining me. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to this next episode of the Mindful Dietitian podcast. It is my great thrill today to be speaking with my friend and colleague, Rachel Hartley, who has written an amazing book. We are going to be speaking about gentle nutrition today, and I wanted to offer Rachel a huge warm welcome. Thanks for coming on. Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much for having me. I'm just really happy to be here. So, Rach, if it feels okay to you, why don't we get started with a little bit about the book, maybe a little bit about the evolution, what was your kind of motivation or your impetus to write it? Um, so, so give us a little bit of a, a, a background lead into the book before we talk about the content itself. Right. Well, I think there were two kind of main things that inspired me to write a book about gentle nutrition um, and, and its role in intuitive eating. I think one was just, you know, and I'm, I'm sure you've noticed this too, in all the dietitian Facebook groups, there's this constant request for, hey, is there any sort of like book or information or blog post that talks about nutrition in a non-diety way or, you know, about this medical condition? Like, is there any resource out there that talks about food and medical nutrition therapy that isn't focused on weight? And there was always just kind of like this dearth of, of resources. Like there are people like maybe like a blog post here and there, but it was very clear to me that, um, you know, for someone who wants to learn about nutrition and not have it with like a side of, of, of diet culture and fat phobia, like there's not much out there. So I, I think that was definitely something that got my brain thinking about a book that really focused on gentle nutrition. Um, the other was really conversations with, with my clients. You know, I found that there was a lot of like misunderstanding about gentle nutrition. I remember one client in particular where you know, we'd been working together for quite a few months and she was in this really good place with like her, her relationship with food. And, you know, from my just kind of like dietitian hat, like evaluating her eating patterns, like she was eating in a really balanced and and nutritious, like variety, like uh, uh, she was already incorporating gentle nutrition. And, um, and she said something to me that was essentially like, what, you know, essentially when are we going to start talking about like gentle nutrition or I want to start like talking about gentle nutrition or or learning about it. I'm like thinking to myself, like, well, I mean, what you're there, (laughs) like what, like you're, you have a really healthy eating pattern and, and just kind of in talking with her about that and sort of helping her explore ways of, um, or, or just explore, um, what, what her idea of gentle nutrition was like, I realized she kind of thought this, like, who, like you've graduated the first nine principles of intuitive eating. And now here's gentle nutrition. Like here's your kale and quinoa salad. Yeah. (laughs) So, yeah. So I think just in having that conversation, it made me realize how, um, not understanding gentle, like, it, there's a good reason it's the last principle of intuitive eating. And when we don't talk about it, it creates all this mystery and, and um, can actually even, I think, be a barrier in, in people healing their relationship with food. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. And for many of our clients, they have come from a background of enjoying food and of Um, having a relationship with food, which is one of friendliness and calmness and joy. Um, You know, a lot of them enjoy cooking and food prep that, you know, aside from how the eating disorder has impacted that. And so, you know, what I really loved about your book, what I love, I should say, not in past tense, loved as in when I 
read it the first time, (laughs) (laughs) is that it really does um, aim to come to, to the coming back process, to the reconnecting with food and eating in a way that really honors us and and also honors the process of the experience of the eating disorder as well or of disordered eating or chronic dieting or whatever we name as the mechanism by which we have become distanced from our food relationship so hmm. I really appreciate you saying that because I one thing that was important to me um you know I I find that intuitive eating oftentimes gets talked about and, and really health at every size too, in the context of, of eating disorders. And I, you know, and I, I work with eating disorder, like clients who are in recovery. Like I, I, I have so much respect for like the role of intuitive eating and different principles of intuitive eating in recovery. But I also didn't want to create something that was like an eating disorder recovery book, but I also wanted to make sure that it was respecting that it was, it was a safe and helpful resource for people who were in recovery. So that, that really um, hearing that really, I, I, I appreciate that. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I think what we're speaking to here is that, people's um the the process or the uh, or the the mechanisms by which people become distanced from food eating and their bodies really occurs along a spectrum and you know much of what impacts that spectrum exists outside of us anyway right you know the the messages from diet culture and all the different um ways in which we are disempowered in our food and eating choices and the way we are, are, you know, given permission or lack thereof to live in our bodies as they are. So, yeah, it's kind of, I see it along a spectrum. So I I really appreciate your thoughtfulness with that and that um, to some degree, I mean, I guess it could be said uh, that, that that every human being, particularly living in Western cultures, at some point in our lives, we have become somewhat disconnected with that innate sense of being able to, to, to feed and nourish ourselves. And so I can imagine that, that m- most people would find gentle nutrition accessible. Right, right. And I I see where, you know, and I I, kind of getting to what I was, you know, sharing before, I think it's gentle nutrition, intuitive eating, it is this tool that can be so helpful for so, so many people. And this idea where it's, it's, you know, just a a recovery tool. And and I say like just a recovery tool in the little quotation marks, but I, I think that that, um, can sometimes make it a little bit feel a little bit off limits for for people who don't identify it as as someone who is in you know in recovery from an eating disorder. So um, yeah, so so again, I, I I appreciate that that was something you recognized in the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. So what I really love about the sections, um, oh, actually, do you know what? I'm going to pause and uh-huh. rewind, and if it's okay with you, to to. To explain how the book is set out, laid out before we kind of go into the actual gentle nutrition sections, because what I really appreciated about the layout is that there was the, the you really clearly made an effort to front load the the start of the chapters so that you're setting people up with a really solid understanding about the rationale for why you know, um, for, for why intuitive eating can be beneficial for us. And, you know, the first three or four chapters actually doesn't really, when you, you get into the food and recipes a bit later in the book, really. So can you step us through a little bit of your thoughts as to the, the kind of the layout of it? Yeah, no, that was one of the hardest things to do was to figure out like what is going to be the um, the layout of this mm-hmm. book because again, I, I wanted to create this book that was for people who who were who knew about intuitive eating and and just wanted to explore this other area of it and something that like 
someone who had no idea what intuitive eating was could pick up and and not feel like totally lost by it. So what I I sort of did is I I started off with the first three chapters, give a little bit more of like the rationale behind, um, you know, intuitive eating and, and gentle nutrition. So I have a chapter that talks about like just why dieting doesn't work and, and how dieting and intentional weight loss and, and weight stigma, like how that makes us actually unhealthy, like how that harms health. Um, I had a chapter in there that did sort of a overview of, of what intuitive eating is and, and the different mm. principles, which I sort of grouped into instead of doing like the one by one principles, talked more about it in terms of themes of intuitive eating, like permission and, um, and treating your body kindly. Um, I did a chapter. It was really, actually, this was probably my favorite chapter to write. That was the one on redefining health and, um, getting to look at like how we, how we conceptualize health as like, or, or when I say we, like, you know, most of society conceptualizes health as this like outcome of food and fitness and really talking about why health is so much more than what we feed ourselves and um, so much more than, than how we move our body and so much more than our weight and um, really kind of getting into things like the determinants of health and, and being able to kind of sneak a little bit of like messaging about um, um, a, about, um, you know, access to healthcare and all these really important pieces of the, the, the health puzzle that get overlooked, um, when we get obsessive about, you know, blueberries and kale and, and quinoa and all this stuff. So I, I really wanted people to have an understanding of like, why, why gentle nutrition, why intuitive eating, like, why are these paradigms that, um, that can be beneficial? And, um, yeah, so that, that was, um, kind of a definitely started off with that, that, um, yeah, with, uh, like you said, kind of like front loading it. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I think what it really does is it contextualizes the why, like, why is it that gentle nutrition is towards the back end of the intuitive eating principles? Like, why don't we lead with that when it seems as though you know if we were to listen to all the dominant quote-unquote health messaging what's right up front right you know eat in this way move in this way live in this way there's you know usually not really much about self-care there's usually not much about mental health about social connection you know and all that stuff and so I think the way that you really thoughtfully laid out the the, the kind of the rug and you know and like hey come to my picnic this is this is a an analogy that I use a lot by the way Rach is you know hey welcome to my picnic can I introduce you to you know the entree here so to speak um because it what what this really role models in in kind of in the way that all the chapters are laid out is that understanding the almost understanding the entry point into well hang on a second I'm just going to rewind here for a second so almost understanding how we became disconnected can then help us understand how to come back because what I notice is a lot of a lot of the time we we as dietitians feel very under pressure and our clients feel very under pressure to like get our shit together right and unless we unless we kind of understand how it is that we've become disconnected, then I'm not sure that we have a good roadmap back almost. Yeah, absolutely. No, a hundred percent. It's sort of understanding like, why do I feel so like weird around food? Like why is food this like anxiety filled thing for me? And just kind of like understanding how it got to be, like you you said, it, it gives you this roadmap and, and, it's sort of, you know, it, it kind of gets to what I, I like to call the unofficial thesis of my book, which is to eat a little bit healthier. First, you have to chill out about food a bit, um, <laughs> chill out about nutrition a bit. And, and it, I, I think my, my hope too, with that is, is, you know, laying that groundwork, but also helping people feel a little bit more calm about food and really recognize like, that, that when I introduce nutrition, it's not in the context of like, oh my goodness, nutrition is the end all be all of health. And I have to do all these things perfectly. Like 
that even the most rational evidence-based, like, you know, seemingly flexible uh, nutrition advice is going to feel rigid if someone feels like it is this thing that is, um, going to make or break their health. So really like the first few chapters in a way too, are just like this, like nutrition's cool and all, but it really isn't the biggest deal. (laughs) No, I love that. I love that because I think when like even thinking about it from a nervous system perspective, if we are really anxious and caught up and, you know, our whole body is in a more activated and and rigid state, then things like our digestive system gets impacted, our motivation to to prepare and, um, or, or, you know, even call for takeout, like whatever, whatever that is, you know, however you procure your food, um, you know, completely morally neutral there, um, that that gets impacted as well. So being able to chill out a little as you say I love that I think that's great Mm -hmm. chill out a little bit allows our biological system to come into a place where we have even more capacity to enjoy food and on a very basic level even to get food into the house or to put put some semblance of food together you know whether that's a snack or a meal or you know however it looks right right 100 percent. yes because you know, when we're stressed out about food, you know, that, that does not, it's not conducive for decision-making. Um, you you don't make like, I don't know, like, I don't make smart decisions when I'm super stressed out. I forget that I forget appointments that I have with, um, (laughs) the one piano um, I have, you know, you get scattered. And so it's like, you know, if we can kind of clear that noise away a little bit, um, I think it gives people a bit more headspace to where they they're able to make decisions about food that they're feeling confident in. So, yeah, so that's why I really try to like, you know, go through that first and then introduce the, um, more nutrition and food focused piece of the book, which is, um, you know, a chapter that's about gentle nutrition and really just like breaking things down into very like flexible, or at least my, my hope, my intention, like breaking it down into like just evidence-based um nutrition information but presented in a way that's really flexible and not like a you have to do this but like here's like something that's beneficial and also like you're not going to die if you don't do this every single day or if you don't like you know apply this air quote perfectly so I have a chapter on on gentle nutrition then it kind of goes into more about um, like making the idea of making changes and how we um, how we um, incorporate health promoting habits into our life and um, yeah and then finally I had a chapter that was more on like the talking about skills around food, whether it's flexible meal planning or um, how to like stock your pantry so that you're able to throw together like simple and satisfying and and nourishing meals. So just more that kind of, um, uh, yeah, just like the food self-care skills. (laughs) Yeah, I love that. So food self-care is one of the topics that we often don't necessarily talk about a lot, especially maybe in community or public health. And yet that's what I really, really loved about about the book and particularly in that chapter there is coming back to setting our foundation and that nourishing ourselves is actually part of mindful self-care and part of um, attending to our needs and also the needs of others as well if we're preparing or, um, you know, feeding others as well. Um, But that it's, it's really foundational and that gets lost when we're applying all these rules and regulations and um, all these anxiety provoking uh, feelings on top of, on, on top of the, the kind of the foundational stuff. Right. Right. Well, you know, I was, yes. And we, you know, we talk a lot in intuitive eating about how we're, we're unlearning these external diet rules and, and sort of tapping into our um, internal cues, but there's also some valuable external and not, not diet rules, but there's some valuable things that we learn externally. Like I think about just basic skills that you learn about food or like cultural traditions you learn around food from your family. Um, you know, I think about like, I learned things like 
how to have a pantry that like a refrigerator that is well stocked with lots of different like condiments and fun flavors um, from from my mom's um, very overcrowded and full um, refrigerator that has lots of like fun kind of condiments in there. You know, um, you learn about how to put together like, or hopefully learn how to put together a satisfying meal by observing what your, your family, like, you know, when they put lots of different food groups on the table. And so obviously those are skills that not, unfortunately, not everybody is able to, to access or, or to, to get in their house, but but, um, but I, I think that, that there is like information about food that can actually help us eat more intuitively, like, or external information about food that can help you eat more intuitively. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, and um, when we're kind of, when you present uh, a lot of the food and um, recipe related information, what I really love about it is that it's really done in a very inviting uh, neutral, non-judgy way. It's like, here are some ideas. Take or leave it. it you know, this yep. might feel good, or it might feel not. You know, not not great. Which really lies in contrast to a lot of other, even food or nutrition books, which it's it seems like too too much for people, or too too fancy, or too much of a reach, or too far away. And of course, all humans, no matter where you kind of where you exist that if something feels too much it's really unmotivating we're, we're, we're not we're not necessarily going to be driving towards a place that feels too much so yeah just can you help us understand a little bit about how you kind of how you laid out that section because it's clear that you were very thoughtful about that you know I, I know you you're you're a real foodie yourself you could have put some kind of complex things in there but you didn't you didn't you really were thoughtful about this sense of meeting people where they're at and making a really good estimate of that so can you can you talk a little bit about that because I think that as a dietitian can really help us to build that bridge with our clients right right and I mean like the recipe section of the book yeah yeah yeah. Um, yeah so there there's 50 recipes in the book and it's um you know it's interesting Yes, I, when the publisher kind of reached out to me with this book idea, they kind of wanted it to be partially, like partially intuitive eating and partially recipes. And I was really kind of at first, like, oh, is that really going to fit? But the more I started thinking about it, the more I, I realized, like, you know, food and cooking and, and talking about like, you, just like being in the kitchen, it is this really lovely tool for, for building more comfort with food and, and, you know, um, uh, addressing our fears that are around food and, and incorporating a variety and also bringing in some of these aspects of, of gentle nutrition. So yeah, I, it's funny when you, when I was thinking about recipes that I, I wanted to do, I had to really like hold myself back a bit. Cause I think I have this, like, I I'm definitely like a big food lover. I love trying new foods. Like I I'm one of those weirdos who like at the end of the day, I actually feel very like soothed and relaxed by being in the kitchen and, and cooking. And, um, I, you don't see it now because I've packed up my office for, for when we move in a couple of months, but I have lots of cookbooks and there was definitely an urge that, that I had to be like, let's do this like fancy this and do this condiment here and that there and then I do this like complicated technique and to feel like oh my goodness I need to show off my cooking skills right (laughs) right right but I really had to like hold like think about first not so much like what is the most like I don't know like the coolest most interesting whatever but to think about like what are actual dishes and and um you know foods that that can be um that are just like helpful skills for for people to have like Mm. I have um one recipe that that is um it's like three different like easy pasta sauces and and I do like a few different sauces that I, I have recipes for and talk about like a, how do you like make a satisfying pasta dish and B, how, like what, what, um, pasta sauces taste best with whole grain pasta, what tastes best with, um, you know, with white pasta and kind of like 
using that as an, using the recipes as an outlet for teaching. Um, same thing with like, um, I have a, um, uh, I have like a sheet pan recipe in there and kind of talking more about you, like using sheet pan meals. I have a muffin recipe that okay, uses hang on, like, pause, pause, pause. You're going to have oh, to stop what? there because I don't know what a sheet pan is. What's a sheet pan? <laughs> <laughs> My goodness, where, how do you Interpretation. <laughs> what Pinterest yeah, wait you don't know Pinterest either no 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 no. I know what Pinterest no. is <laughs> like, so, like, come on no I know what Pinterest is I just I don't hang out there so sheet pan it sounds this is a foreign word to me what is what is this oh my goodness this is the best um so sheet pan like a I guess like a baking like almost like a baking a, tray yeah, a baking sheet. And so you do like a one, like a, a literally a one dish meal where you have like a protein and a starch and a vegetable and you like add a yummy sauce and you put it all in the oven together. And so it's just sort of like all baked in one, like on one sheet pan versus like messing up different dishes. I have never heard of this before. <laughs> How have I never heard of this? I don't know. What are they doing in Australia? <laughs> Well, I don't know. We're either way ahead or way behind one or the other. <laughs> I, can, I can never tell. I can never tell. Do you know, <laughs> something else that came up, it was uh, in a conversation, mm, I can't remember, it was in a conversation with perhaps other dietitians, and I mentioned a slice tray and and people were like, what are you talking about? A sli- Do you know what I'm talking about? I have no idea. <laughs> Okay, so here we go. <laughs> Give one, take one, Rach. Yay. <laughs> so a slice tray is like a, um, uh, it's like uh, it's like an inch high uh-huh. and it's like a small baking tray. So it's like what you would make a, what do you call the, what, what would you call? So we call a slice, it's usually sweet and it's, and it sometimes has layers in it and you cut it up into um rectangles what do you call that like a oh like a bar like yes like bars yes yes but what do you call what you put it in so like a cast almost like like I mean like a I guess like a casserole dish is what I kind of call it or like a like the like you know like an eight by eight like I honestly do I call it (laughs) right so isn't this interesting that even in very very basic kind of food words or terms or things like that it's it doesn't always translate it's really interesting isn't it like uh-huh. I don't even know what I was talking about so for us it's metal and it's different than a casserole dish it is it, uh-huh. a casserole dish for us is either ceramic or glass and yeah. it's got a rounded edge to it usually and so a sliced tin would have a square edge and huh. yeah, you bake bars in it. It's like an alternative to making biscuits or cookies um, yeah. that would go in school lunches or you'd have it as a snack or part of a meal for sure. You can have it whenever, really. But there's like, I'll give you an example. So there's like a caramel slice, which has like a biscuit base and then the caramel in the middle and the chocolate on the top. That's a really popular one. Leaner shortbread. That's what, what I always call oh, it. Oh, that's so interesting. I love it but it's so it's so fun because like food is such a like just in having this conversation thinking about like it's so I don't know it's just so fun to like learn about food and talk about food and um and there's so many ways that you can talk about it in a non-judgmental way um by the way I'm judging you a little bit about not knowing what a sheet pan is (laughs) (laughs) judge away make judgy judgy (laughs) judging with judges but um yeah, I mean, it's so cool to be able, like, there's so many conversations we can have about food itself. And with intuitive eating, we get so wrapped up in the principles and the theory. And like, yeah. it's cool, like, that's cool and interesting and fascinating. But you're know, talking about food as a food itself and recipes is also another way that we can um, integrate these, these principles and use as a, a learning tool and really just a tool for helping people feel more like chill and cool about food. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think, I mean, I know that, um, you know, you and I being dietitians with solid relationships with food and eating, you know, that's one thing us having this kind of lighthearted conversation. And Mm. also I think 
you know, really what we're talking about here is really easing off the seriousness of every single meal, every single bite, every single ingredient to be able to find a little bit of space in your mind, in your body, in your creativity that if you do want to pursue having an, a more interesting or varied um, way of eating, then that, that, you know, that door is available to you. Um, you know, and, and there are plenty of people out there who really aren't that interested in, you know, yeah. recipes and um, making food. And yet feeding ourselves is something that's right. really important. Right. Exactly. It's something that like nobody has to be interested in cooking. Like, and it's totally understandable given like the really um, traumatic experiences people have had with food and dieting. Like, It's really understandable why, why someone wouldn't want to have a, or wouldn't be interested in, in cooking and recipes and like the food piece. Um, and for those who are like, it, I, I'm, I'm happy to provide this like resource and tool. <laughs> No, it's awesome. So I wanted to ask you, um, you know, the book itself hasn't been out that long, but I'm I'm really interested in feedback that you're getting from people, like whether it's from other dietitians, our colleagues, or whether it's from community members or clients, or I'm really interested in the feedback that you've had about it because as an author, I can imagine that that you were in this process for so long that, you know, the, the feedback that you're getting from people, I can imagine is really interesting because you've, you've kind of developed this offering for people and yeah. I, I, so I'm super curious about what, what have people kind of been, been telling you about it? Yeah. I think the coolest thing that, that I've heard and what um, I'm, it makes me feel like the best, like the things that, that just leave me like really smiling for, um, you know, for a while after reading is hearing from a lot of people who've said that, that, you know, I've read, I've been, you know, learning about intuitive eating for a while. I've been reading lots of stuff about intuitive eating. I've been, you know, read these, these books and like, this was something that really helped things click for me. Um, and I, I think as I was thinking about this, um, you know, I, I, I think a lot of people come into intuitive eating with this, this gentle nutrition, or with this gentle nutrition, with this diet mentality mindset, total opposite. Um, they come into intuitive eating with this diet mentality. And so when, when we don't really talk about, like we can talk about intuitive eating and these principles and, and sort of sometimes many times kind of get a little bit stuck up here and, and, you know, in our, our head in the, the, what am I trying to say? Like <laughs> kind of, cognitive, but, cognitive thinking. Realm. Yes, yeah. Yes. Yes. And, um, and it's interesting because, you know, people still have these, these questions and these, like um, these, you know, these very much like uh, concerns about food and eating that are, are, you know, rooted in diet mentality, but they're there. Mm -hmm. And so just being able to actually like help, um, help like people look at nutrition in a different way mm -hmm. and um, to help them kind of like understand this missing piece of, of the puzzle. I, I found that for a lot of, um, or at least I've, I've heard from a lot of people that it's, it's really helped like other aspects of intuitive eating just kind of click. So that's been like a really cool bit of feedback that I've, I've been um, very happy to, to hear. I love that. I can imagine that to be the case because um, it has not been my experience that we go from, I mean, if we were to talk about the principles that we go from one to 10 and we're done, it's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whether we're talking about, um, you know, developing tr awareness, trust, connection, um, you know, and then understanding about all the processes and all the experiences we've had that have led to this point and, you know, diet culture and, um, social norms and patriarchy and all all the all the um all the structures that are inextricably entwined with our food eating and body experiences so I, I i definitely believe that the that this kind of um you know rewind and go over and this kind of looping process that really helps us to strengthen our our really foundations of awareness and trust uh 
you know, strengthened again by the practical food side of things, um, you know, even though we might come to that a little later, I think it, it, it strengthens again those a lot of those earlier stages that we know are so important for longer term recovery. Yeah, no, I like the way you describe that. Yeah, it helps. Yes, it, it sort of helps strengthen like the earlier principles. Like yes. it's a book that dives into this one principle, but I hope there's also information and, and um, you know, analogies and just, uh, you know, ways of thinking about things that help these these other principles click and, and feel a little bit more solid. So I, yeah, I really like how you describe that. Yeah, well, there's certainly going to be times in our life where things happen unexpectedly. You know, I mean, there's been no greater evidence of this than COVID, right? You know, we're, we're, <laughs> yeah, I know the, the whole year, everything about it. Um, and so being able to have, uh, you know, skills and supports that can help us to strengthen a lot of the foundational, um, the, a lot of the foundational principles can only help us, especially when when times get tough. And they, and they will continue to because we're human living in this world. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Life will always be unexpected and, and, um, having just food feel like a solid thing, like in our Mm -hmm. life is, is, um, you know, a privilege and, and also just, um, incredibly helpful when, when it's able to, to be that, to serve Mm -hmm. that role. Yeah, yeah, love that. So, Rach, just to round us out of this conversation, can you let people know, please, where they can find a gentle nutrition? Yeah, so you can order online. I've been encouraging. I don't know. Do you have bookshop in Australia? I don't know if that is that a website. It's a website and it supports like independent um, bookstores. So I've been um, encouraging people in the States to order off of it's bookshop.org, but you know, all the other, you know, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, all that good stuff. um, You know, lots of places where you can, um, where you can order it. And um, yeah, um, I'm trying to think of other places and I'm blanking, but yep. (laughs) I'm I'm sure people look it up and, and it's probably all on your website as well yeah. and it's on my website yes if you go to just rachelhartleynutrition.com it's uh, there's a, a page for my book that has just more information about it yeah perfect and you do play around a little bit on instagram as well don't you i do so feel free if, if anyone wants to connect um at um rachel what am i rachel hartley nutrition no i'm rachel hartley rd i had to think about my handle for <laughs> Um, yep. So Rachel spelled A E L, and um, yes, love to to you know just kind of share you know fun stuff. I, I blog and just kind of sharing random bits through my day, and and yeah, I, I have fun on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. Well, thank you so much for writing this really important book. You know, it certainly uh, has filled a gap. I'll be honest in the market where. Um, as you said, just to, you know, kind of loop us back to the beginning of this conversation, it is often the case that in Facebook groups or in various forums, people are like, oh, I feel like I need a, a resource here to really um, support my my clients and my community members and us too. Like how can how can we, um, you know, up, upskill a bit on building that bridge between, um, you know, the, the work that people do to unlearn diet culture and then come back to themselves and incorporating kind of the practicalities of, of food related self care. So this is this is absolutely the book that fills that gap. It's amazing, and I'm so appreciative to you for writing it. Thank you so much. That really means the the world to me. Because I just um, so respect all of your work and and just your voice in this field and this world. And and so it really just means means a lot coming from you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks, Rach. Well, I look forward to staying connected with you, and um, and hopefully, you know, this the, the let's just call it the big giant world shit show that's going on at the moment will settle down so that we can you know, connect again very soon. Yes, yes, absolutely. I so hope so. <laughs> absolutely. Thanks again, Rach, and um, yeah, look forward to sharing this out with people. Thank you. <laughs> Well, that's our episode of the Mindful Dietitian interview series for today. Thank you so much to our wonderful guest and to you for listening. I really hope you enjoyed it. 
just a reminder that you can find me over on the website www.themindfuldietitian.com.au and please join actually quite a large group of wonderful and enthusiastic dietitians on the closed Facebook group The Mindful Dietitian. The music you hear is called Happiness from Ben Sound used under the Creative Commons license. Have a great day everyone.